Good afternoon and welcome to IFPRI. I'm Rajul Pandya Loach, head of the 2020 Vision Initiative and Chief of Staff here at IFPRI. IFPRI is a neutral independent research organization with a vision of a world free of hunger and malnutrition. We welcome all perspectives and voices that share with us this vision of a world free of hunger and malnutrition. We are delighted to host this inaugural event in DuPont's Agricultural Development Roundtable Series, Agricultural Value Chains, and the Role of the Private Sector. This series aims to foster cooperation between the public and private sectors to address the global challenge of feeding the world in the years to come. With the complex nature of food and nutrition security challenges, the multi-stakeholder and cross-sectoral collaboration has become increasingly important. IFPRI's new strategy, which was released a few weeks ago, places a high premium on strengthening existing partnerships and establishing new ones with a wide range of stakeholders. Today's topic is very timely, given the growing recognition of the potential of agricultural value chains to reduce poverty and food insecurity by linking small farmers' production to global markets. IFPRI has long invested in value chain research, and we have recently scaled up our investment in this area. Value chains feature prominently in the research themes of the two new CGIR research programs that IFPRI leads. For example, under the program Agriculture for Nutrition and Health, some of the research activities focus on opportunities to improve nutrition along the value chain as well as on food safety issues. For the other program that we lead, Policies, Institutions and Markets, research on linking small farmers to markets focuses on innovations across value chains and the impact of upgrading value chains. We welcome you to visit our website for more information on the work we do on value chains. I hope that, like me, you're looking forward to today's insightful di discussions. You have come here to hear some very exciting and interesting speakers. And we are, let me close by saying that we at IFPRI are pleased to collaborate with DuPont on this event. We look forward to deepening our collaboration in the future. And I now hand over the floor to Susan from DuPont, who will give an introduction to the Roundtable series. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Well, I'm really pleased to be here today, and I'm equally as pleased to see how many of you have taken time out of your schedules um, to, to participate today. So welcome, and thank you for taking that time. DuPont is very excited to be collaborating with IFPRI, the premier think tank on international food policy research on this first roundtable in DuPont's 2013 Agriculture Development Roundtable series. In 2012, DuPont launched its food security goals and commissioned the Economist Intelligence Unit to produce the Global Food Security Index. These initiatives represent DuPont's public commitment to making a difference in the lives of the poor and to engaging in public discussions around issues affecting food affordability, availability, and nutritional value. These roundtables provide us with another avenue for DuPont to be a source and receiver of insight on the use of science and technology to address human suffering and an enabler of critical thinking and action to address food insecurity in a sustainable manner. Now today we're very pleased to have with us, in addition to IFPRI, the African Capacity Building Foundation and Islamic Development Bank. They will no doubt bring unique perspectives that will enlighten us all. Our objectives for today's session are to raise awareness, promote a dialogue, and explore actions that help us understand the role of the private sector in enhancing the agricultural value chain. So let me address what we consider to be the agricultural value chain. I'm quite sure that there are differing views on this, but allow me to set the stage for today's discussion. The agricultural value chain should be seen as bookends in the movement of products from the producer to the customer. It could be thought of as a set of activities, technologies, services, and delivery mechanisms that, that allow the products to reach the market. It helps us to understand the relationships and mechanisms for increasing efficiency, productivity, and value. And given that our focus is on emerging markets, we'll want to pay specific attention to pro-poor initiatives that link small businesses with the markets. 
Today, we will look at the role that the private sector plays in supporting value chain development for poverty <coughs> alleviation. So I again want to thank you all for being here, and now I'll turn it over to our moderator for the day, John Heller of Synergos. Thank you. Uh, let me join my colleagues from uh, DuPont and IFPRI in welcoming again everyone to today's roundtable dialogue on agricultural value chains and the role of the private sector. Um, before we dive in, I wanted to just draw everyone's attention to the collaboration between DuPont and IFPRI, which I think in itself is important. Not only are they demonstrating a willingness to learn and share with one another, but they're also open to learning from all of you who are here today. And that's uh, on an issue that's as complex as the one that we're about to discuss that's really notable and important. So thank you all for coming together and providing this space. Um, we have with us today a really extraordinary set of panelists. Each is incredibly knowledgeable about the topic we're going to discuss. And what's fabulous is that each of them is coming from really different perspectives, which is going to uh, really help us have a, real, a rich and um, engaging dialogue today. We have with us James Boro, Executive Vice President DuPont, Dr. Shengen Fan, Director General here at IFPRI, uh, Dr. Franny Liaotier, uh, Executive Secretary of the Africa Capacity Building Foundation and Co-Chair of the World Economic Forum Africa, and Demba Ba, Director, Agricultural and Rural Development at the Islamic Development Bank. Um, before I hand it over to them, um, there are four brief things I wanted to say about the conversation that we would most like to have today. Um, first, I'd like to just make sure that we're clear on the topic and I'd like to refine it a little bit, as you heard Susan and uh, Rajul say. Um, I want to focus on the issue of how the private sector can add the most value along agricultural value chains in emerging markets in order to increase food and nutrition security, so that we're really zeroing in on the issue of food and nutrition security. Um, second. I'd like to set a particular tone for our discussion today. Um, our intention is really to have an open and honest dialogue in a relaxed climate where we can talk about the real issues in a real way. Um, I'd like to have everybody here embrace the spirit of learning from others, of being curious and sharing what you have with the rest of um, everyone who's here today. So a real spirit of learning and sharing. Um, third, we'd like to hear from as many of you as possible. And so the remit that I've given the speakers and also I'll give to all of you during our comment and question period is to be brief, focus right in on the heart of the issue, drill down to what's most important, and again, just be brief so we can hear as many points of view as possible. And lastly, at the end of the day, what we're most looking forward to uh, today is finding uh, actionable ideas, hidden gems, and insights that we can translate into real work on the ground. So we're really looking for action and ideas and takeaways. So um, to kick us off, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to make a few opening remarks. I'd like to start with Jim Borrell. Um, how do you think that the private sector can add the most value to agricultural value chain? <coughs> Let me, start by, let me start by saying, uh, you know, at DuPont we have just great respect for the work that IFPRI does. It's an honor to be here uh, tonight. And um, I don't think the topic that we're talking about could be any more timely. So um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be part of the process. Um, the private sector it can do a lot of things. Um, but if I was going to highlight two that in this, thing, in this uh, vein, I think it would be first science. Um, I think we can provide uh, and have a role to, to make sure that, that uh, we advance science and also that we translate science into local solutions that can really make a difference in people's lives uh, around the world and, and particularly as it relates to food security. Um, and, and secondly, as a, as a private enterprise, hopefully we can be um, a, a key part of helping to build local markets and um, local markets can lead to economic development and, and other good things that can happen. How can we build self-reinforcing cycles of, of productivity and, and, and development? And so as a company, we're investing over $2 billion a year in research and development, which is interesting, but what really matters is having people in place around the world, the, the plant breeders in Kenya that are working to develop local products that work in that environment. So translating, you know, kind of, global, solu uh, global uh, science into local solutions. Um, but of course, 
no one company can do it alone, just like no one government or NGO. So this idea of collaboration along the value chain is really important to us, and we look forward to exploring that with, uh, with the rest of the panel. Well, well, thank you for coming. Um, here at IPRI, we are working together with all different stakeholders for achieving hunger and poverty reduction. Now, we are two years or three years away from 2015, the deadline of MDG goals, or two or three years away. Um, now, we are in the process of developing new vision after 2015, so the 2015 agenda. So what would be a vision for 2015, uh, after 2015? That vision must be ambitious, uh, must be clear or precise, and also realistic. So here, uh, during various high-level consultations, I propose a very clear, simple vision statement. That is to end hunger sustainably by 2025. Here are two keywords here. One is sustainability. We must produce more food with less resources. Because we know that we are facing declining natural resources. Climate is going to hit, our, hit us very hard. So sustainability is a must. Why 2025? If we do not have a clear time frame, then we do not have a clear vision or target. And 2025, I think it is um, it's a real, realistic target, it's an ambitious target. However, if we all work together, we will be able to achieve that target. Different stake, stakeholders have different roles. For the public sector, they needed to invest in infrastructure, R&D. They needed to make sure that IP, intellectual property rights, are protected. So the investors will have incentive to invest. The public sector should also introduce and implement a clear regulations like food safety issues. The second, smallholders must be the center of all this. But smallholders must be organized. So they empower themselves. They, they can increase their voices to deal with the private sector, with the government, and learn from each other. Then the private sector has a very important role. I think don't treat the private sector as, let's say, other side of our business. We got to work with them. And I'm glad that Dupin is committed to do that. And the research institutions like, like IPRI has an important role there as well. So to help to set the baseline, to track and monitor the progress, and to evaluate, to analyze what have worked, what have not worked. We treat it as a learning. So I, I see IPRI has a critical role there. And finally, more importantly, we all have to work together. So the PPP, public, private, research institutions, all these part partnerships. And for that, we have seen some examples already, like uh, you know, in Ethiopia, Ethiopian government, USID, PepsiCo have worked together on the chickpea. And look at the nutrition impact, look at the health impact, look at the environmental impact, look at the impact on smallholders' income. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for the uh, invitation, and it's great to be sharing a panel with uh, IFPRI, DuPont, and the Islamic Development Bank. Um, I'll start off by saying that uh, what we have learned is that countries need to have four key things in place for the private sector role to really uh, have an impact in agriculture and in food security. First, they have to have a good strategy. But most countries can't implement strategy. They need to learn from the private sector how do you get from an, an idea to implementation. And here's a very important role for the private sector. The second, they need to have skills that are modern skills to manage agriculture in a scientific and effectively managed sector. Right now, in most emerging countries, uh, the skill level utilized in agriculture is very low. So the private sector can, can be engaged in developing and, and training and getting people to think with the private sector mindset, looking at agriculture as a business 
and, and investing and thinking about risk, uh, how to bring in new ideas, scientific ideas and knowledge, and integrate them with traditional knowledge and know-how to get results. The third thing countries need is a, a, a system that picks up these innovations and scales them up. Again, markets are one of the most important uh, uh, avenues for transmitting ideas, but the private sector, through its partnership with governments and civil society, including women's organizations, uh, because women now make up between 65 and 80 percent of labor in agriculture in most emerging countries, how to bring all that together and have it sp sped up in the transmission of ideas using uh, modern technology, telephones, uh, uh, networks of, of uh, websites, radio, etc. And the last area which the uh, private sector is very critical in, in bringing to place is linking up uh, the missing links in the value chain. I'll give an example of uh, vegetables and fruits, which has become one of the most successful uh, areas where the private sector has come into packaging, creating markets, and, and allowing then produce to be transported without waste and rot, and bringing much needed nutrition to young children in, in urban areas or remote rural areas because of that intervention. Uh, uh, the example from uh, a number of countries comes in Kenya, being one of them where this has been very effective. Uh, South Africa is another country, <coughs> but also Burkina Faso, uh, which is an arid country, but through effective partnerships with the private sector and using scientific knowledge, bringing in business ideas and investing in the logistics chain, you get these solutions uh, to come forth. I think there are many other ideas, but the last one I'll put on the table is transnational investments. It's very difficult for countries to make that last mile investment that unlocks trade, uh, removes logistics bottlenecks for food to move from one place to the other. And the private sector has been very effective in pushing for policy change, border, border issues, uh, to, to get them removed so that transport can flow, logistic solutions can come up, and regional markets can emerge. Um, I think those are some of the few examples I can point to. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I would like to thank DuPont and IFRI for uh, really putting together this uh, panel to discuss a topic that is, on one hand, very current in most of uh, the policymakers around the world, and second, also a topic that uh, affects probably the most people in today's uh, world, and particularly the most vulnerable people around the world. Uh, I would like to take this question through two prisms. One is to say the private sector, frankly, can make a huge difference in accessibility of food around the world. This, I think, the private sector can do better than anyone. Second, it can also have a major impact on the affordability of food. And I would like to uh, point to maybe three ways in which I think the private sector can do this the best. Uh, first, I believe that uh, when one looks at the way food is traded around the world and it moves from production to the table, global supply chains today are primarily controlled by the private sector. And applying the most efficient supply chains and integrating trade of food into global supply chains can substantially bring down the cost of getting food to the people, but also it can improve the accessibility and get the food to places where otherwise some types of food would not get in place. If you think of you know, where you can find a bottle of Coca-Cola around the world and how effective that system of distribution is, if you can distribute nutrition and food around those supply chains, that tells you a little bit how you can translate these efficient systems into the supply of food. Uh, the second is uh, basically how does the private sector help mainstream innovation and technology into both production and transformation of food. Um, companies like DuPont do tremendous amount of research in innovation. Uh, I, development banks do finance research and innovation, but what we are observing in the field today is that that research and innovation is having a very hard time getting into the hand of the 
producers, particularly the small farmers. So I think if we can find a way of mainstreaming or using or leveraging the private sector into mainstreaming research, innovation, science and technology into production, all the way to the value chain of, uh, of food that will make a difference. I think uh, higher yield uh, seeds, uh, post-harvest, for example, if you take some of our countries, uh, post-harvest losses amount to 30 to 40 percent. Okay, and therefore some of the technology, you know, in conservation and transportation that is readily available if we can get that into the post-harvest harvest, uh, stage of the supply chain of food, that would make a huge difference. So I think mainstreaming innovation and science and technology into the agricultural value chain is something the private sector definitely has a comparative and competitive advantage is doing. Uh, we are seeing also that even in drought resistant uh, crops or drought resistant seeds or how does one for example in the face of increasing amount of marginal land how does one use biosaline agriculture research to bring into production areas that were not into po possible to bring into production a few years back I think those are areas where again the private sector would have certainly a comparative advantage the third and last one I would point to is really one whereby the, the investment that's necessary to really meet the increasing demand for food and the amount of resources needed to finance the research and development into agriculture, that also will be something certainly we would expect the private sector to play a role. But provided there is some profit or business proposition underlying it, because I don't think the private sector is by definition primarily interested in food security if it is not profitable. So the two have to kind of uh, go together and, and, and couple. So, uh, where do I think in finance they can make a difference is by matching the profile of the investment with the resources that are available. Because we have a mismatch between the profile of agricultural business and the type of risk profile in agricultural activities and the type of financial products and services that are offered. So that mismatch, I think the private sector can also make a difference in. Thank you. Thank you all for those really interesting opening remarks. I know I have a lot of follow-up questions. Um, we're going to turn over to the audience in a little bit, and I certainly welcome each of you if you have questions for one another or comments on what you're speaking about to, to share them. Um, I wanted to stick with uh, Mr. Ba for a minute, if it's okay. If, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the role of financial institutions, since you come from a development bank. What, what's, the, what's the best role that uh, development banks and financial institutions can play around um, you know, this issue, as you were mentioning, of in increasing the accessibility and affordability of food. Well, uh, I see around the room a lot of development bankers, so feel free to jump in. But in my, in my humble view, there are about five areas I would say uh, MDBs can play a role. Uh, the first one is uh, to try and create the right type of policy and regulatory framework or environment that uh, enables that private investment to come in. I live now in a region that is afloat with money and resources. The Saudi government just put in place an $800 million investment fund from its sovereign wealth fund into a corporation called SALIG, the Saudi Investment Fund in Agriculture and Livestock. And basically that fund is looking for opportunity along the supply chains or value chains of food, uh, livestock, red meat, where should Saudi private sector be positioned so that they can have some control over the uh, supply of Saudi Arabia. So the resources, again, there it shows are not really the constraints. What is really constraining is to find a right destination, a good destination that matches those resources. So I think uh, the right policy and environment is something that MDBs can support government put in place, and Frani had mentioned that. The second is that some of the, the, the private investment would require some concessional uh, dimension, like particularly into the basic infrastructure or some of the uh, public good nature of investment. I think there, MDBs can be providers also of concessional financing that will match some of the private investment that is needed. Uh, I also do think when you look at investment in agriculture, which is often often relatively risky, someone needs to step in and buy down the non-commercial risk. 
okay, in the form of political risk insurance or in the form of non-commercial <coughs> risk. So I think some type of uh, risk sharing to ensure that the private sector uh, investment can be profitable, can be a role the MDBs can, can play. And those we have done in IDB, and I think the World Bank also does that. Um, the fourth area is some sort of a level playing field with respect to access to market. You, most of you know that how highly regulated some of these markets are. And frankly, it is no longer the case where you produce your beans or your, or your potatoes or, or tomatoes and you can freely access the market. So there is a cost to accessing the market. And I think there, again, MDBs through either support for negotiating bilateral trade agreements or level or regional integration would also be an area where they can play a role. And last but not least is really helping build institutions for trade and and, and, uh, and research, local institutions. I think the institutional capacity of governments to really attract investment, be it investment promotion or regulation or trade supporting institution, that you know, those are the five areas I think that will be critical. And my friend uh, Franny here has a lot of work in the Africa capacity building to do in, in that area. Thank you, Mr. Bond. Actually, I'd like to come back to capacity building if it's okay. Um, and so you mentioned some of the, the capacities that, uh, that governments need to have in order to engage the private sector, good strategy, and you need skills within the country, and you need systems that pick up innovation. I, I'd like to ask a how question. So what's the best way you think that private sector companies can engage in that, in, in building capacity, in making the best kind of uh, lasting capacity contributions in country? I think Demba has put a lot of issues on the table where capacities will also be needed at the country level to make them success successful in partnership with multilateral development banks and other players. The private sector can do a number of things. The first one is to invest in business schools where the curriculum goes beyond the traditional business curriculum also looks at agriculture as a business. I think this is one big missing link when you look at business schools across the world. Very few of them really look at agriculture as a business. And the whole agricultural value chain can benefit from that. And the private sector can support those kind of schools and can also bring uh, know-how from their own experience when you look at most of the players in the value chain, whether it's Coca-Cola or Nestle, uh, Unilever, they have a lot of experience in, in bringing uh, private solutions to the food markets. Uh, the second area the private sector can be engaged in is by helping uh, players, stakeholders like commercial banks, uh, microcredit uh, organizations to understand the agricultural business so that they can shape the right products, financial products. A very good example, you look at the Central Bank of, of Nigeria, Governor Sanusi put in place a few innovative products, and Nigerian farmers now are taking risks that they didn't take before in agriculture. And I think this is very critical to bring those skills. And he was in the private sector for many years, so he could bring that to the central bank and use instruments to, to uh, help uh, push uh, risk taking in the, in the agricultural sector. The third area the private sector can help is by demonstration. Uh, for example, even in these areas where the markets are not profitable, but the private sector through corporate social responsibility, through its own R&D, can partner with communities, with smallholders, and investigate and research different ways of doing agriculture, and then bringing those solutions to bear so that they can move into profitable areas. This is a rich opportunity for learning. And here I'm, I'm, I, may, I can mention the work that DuPont has been doing in a few uh, areas like sorghum, which is one example where you can do that, take a single product and move it all the way. Uh, but there are many other examples uh, that one could, could point at. The fourth area, which is really cl critical, is, is where the private sector can support stakeholders in different parts of the value chain in, in bridging the markets where they don't exist, either because there are information asymmetries that are being held. If you, for instance, have monopolies in seed distribution, which causes huge problems in terms of identifying uh, new, new ideas that come from research, because the, those who are already in the market 
push the ideas that are already uh, known. And so being able to open up competition in, in the world of ideas, of course respecting uh, patents and, and research and, and making sure that innovation can yield uh, returns for the investors, but doing that in a way that experiments can actually have broader value. And, and push the, the frontier in terms of, of uh, productivity improvements, uh, land efficiency, but also yields. Uh, the last area I would say is the private sector, uh, as, uh, as Demba has mentioned, has a huge global uh, footprint or handprint. And I think this could be a very good opportunity when you use fora like the World Economic Forum or our own African Capacity Building Foundation Board of Governors, where people come from different countries, to use those fora to push uh, ideas and knowledge on how you get good policy in place, what sort of partnerships make sense. I think Schengen mentioned in the beginning the importance of partnerships and how those could be effective in pushing the public sector to do the needed reforms. Uh, also, to bring uh, ideas of where financing instruments have worked particularly effectively. For instance, Africa could learn a lot from China and India in agriculture. And how can those ideas come to the table through the Chinese private sector that's investing around the world, but also through the research institutions that are partnering with the private sector. And, and similarly, in terms of uh, ideas from Latin America, where the private sector has been very effective also in pushing critical ideas around. So I think capacity building is something the private sector doesn't really look at as its area of expertise, but I think it could do a lot. Thank you. Very helpful comments. Um, I, I'd like to, to come back to something that, that many of the panelists have mentioned, but also address this question to Dr. Fon, but also to, to everyone on the panel. And it's really around how do we make sure that private sector investments in agriculture really drill down to communities that are poor and suffering and really in need? And how do we engage with smallholder farmers so that investments don't get somehow stuck at some other level, but don't drill down to the ground? I, I wonder if you could address that, uh, Dr. Fon. I think firstly, the, the land rights is critically important. You must have heard this terminology called a land grab or land grabbing. Well, when the private sectors come to Africa, including some of the emerging economies, the private sector come to Africa to invest. Well, they need the land. Um, if these smallholders' land rights are not secured, then it's very difficult to protect these smallholders. So the secure land rights will be so critical. Now. The smallholders, as I said, smallholders are the centers of all these discussions. How can the private sector to help the smallholders? Their technology, so the technology development by DuPan in collaboration with the government or government, public research institutions, this technology must be smallholders friendly, so smallholders will be able to access. The second is many smallholders fa face risks market risks, um, the climate or weather risks, um, and health risks. So how can the private sector help smallholders access to insurance, access to credit? Uh, that's something we have not discussed much. Uh, and finally, the the nutrition is, is critically important here. So smallholders need to feed their family. But by producing more nutritious food, so their family will be able to consume nutritious food. If these smallholders can also sell nutritious and save food to the markets, then they will earn the income so their, their children uh, can be sent to schools for their, their uh, further education. So the private sector again has a role there to make sure that the good nutrition has to be reflected in pricing. So when the smallholder produces nutritious food, they have to be paid for doing that. And I know that um, smallholders by themselves involve huge transactions costs. So you cannot deal with one million smallholders. So if smallholders can be organized, I, I had a very good discussion with a Malawi Smallholders Association, Daibang. The, uh, the president is Daibang. 
he has 100,000 smallholders in his association. So instead of dealing with these 100,000 smallholders, you can deal with this association. This association is owned by smallholders. Um, they have political voice to push government to change certain policies. They also have bargaining powers when they deal with the super, uh, deal with the uh, private sector, the, um, the supermarkets, uh, and the multinational companies, uh, and the uh, the private companies in their own countries as well. Thank you. Any of the other panelists want to comment on the smallholder engagement issue? I just want to point the fact that, uh, contrary to common belief, smallholders are really not marginal. I mean, in Africa, smallholders produce the bulk of the food, and therefore they have to become center stage in terms of solution design and the way we think of technology and even financing. So if we want to succeed in food security in most of the developing countries, we need to tailor the the technology packages, the financing packages, so that they meet the profile of the smallholders. And I think there is an increasing awareness of the role of the smallholders. I would like to point to an emerging phenomenon that we're also seeing in the field is that when we, say, when we talk about private sector, we have to think also of the philanthropists as new players in the area of development we are seeing an increasing amount of philanthropists who are actually tabling more money than governments in the development scene. And in IDB, for example, we are very proud of the partnership we have with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where we do some leverage financing. Uh, they will be in Doha uh, next week, I believe, the World uh, Vaccine Summit, where basically you will have up to 500 million of private donation money that have been raised to fund research and development in vaccines in malaria and some other areas. So I think I would like to add to the, to the debate the private sector as a newcomer uh, and a new financier of development, and we have to uh, deal with that. So the smallholders, to me, are requiring an adaptation of the products and services to really deal with them. And I think the private sector and governments and MDBs have to start seeing them as actually direct clients. Just to reinforce the idea of the importance of the smallholder, uh, you know, we, we often talk about 860 million people that are chronically malnourished, and my understanding is about 650 million of those are smallholder farms and farmers and farm families. So if, if we're going to solve the food security issue, it's got to start with smallholder farmers for lots of reasons. Um, but maybe an example or two that, that we're finding um, helpful around working with smallholders. The, uh, I think everybody's mentioned the idea of getting knowledge to the farmer and getting them the education and, 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 the, and the products that work for them. Um, an example might be our, our DuPont Pioneer seed business. We have, a, uh, we have some uh, outstanding performing hybrid maize seed that from South Africa up to Ethiopia where maize is a staple is working very well. At, but you can't just give the seed to the farmer or even sell the seed to the farmer and have the solution be there. They need the information. They need the agro agronomic understanding to be able to really uh, plant it, uh, cultivate it well, know how much fertilizer to use, etc. So there's some education that goes with it. But when we do that, when we get the whole thing together, the, the results are amazing. From a half a ton per hectare, which is less than enough to feed the family for a year, to four or five tons per hectare. So they're selling it in the market, they're adding a roof to their house, they're sending their kids to school, and it, it, it's, a, it's life changing. So the, but the challenge is, um, for a company like us, Peng and I think you mentioned there are hundreds of millions of smallholder farmers. So it's hard for us to do that on our own. We're doing that as fast as we can. We're expanding as rapidly as, you, as the business will support. But um, we're really excited about a partnership with the Ethiopian government and USAID that, that, um, that we formed not long ago it, it, around, uh, it's called AMSAP, uh, Advanced Maize Seed Adoption Program. But the idea is we can get um, uh, hybrids that will really help farmers significantly improve productivity, but we need help with 
um, education extension, we need help with resources, we need help with on the fertilizer side. So between ATA and the uh, Ethiopian government and USAID's um, both funding and local capability, the, the three of us together we think can significantly accelerate the impact. And that's good, that's really a win-win-win. Certainly it'll, it'll be business for us, but what's really <coughs> important is a lot more smallholder farmers will move from subsistence to economically viable and uh, that'll be good for them and their families and their communities. That'll be good for the Ethiopian government. So it, it, the, I think the challenge we face is how do you, how do you create these collaborations uh, rapidly, lots of them, and how do you scale them up rapidly? Um, but there really are some exciting things uh, happening that I think are gonna make a real difference. Do you feel that those kind of collaborations are gonna be becoming more and more uh, important as time goes on? Ab absolutely. Um, you know, uh, uh, Franny mentioned one earlier with the, the, around our work in sorghum. That wouldn't, and to build on Demba's point, um, we have some technology that can in, in increase the nutrient levels of sorghum, and in, in, particularly in Western Africa where it's a staple, um, hugely important. But the, the market doesn't really justify the kind of investment it would take for us to be able to do it just based on the return we'd, we'd get. But we have the science, but it started with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation first, providing some funding, working with also with some local seed companies and other uh, local organizations on the, on the continent. Um, that went through phase one, phase two, it's now the Buffett Foundation that's working with us uh, to take it to, but we wouldn't have been able to get it there on our own just based on a market environment, but the philanthropists along with the scientists, along with the local organizations that can actually make it real and get it to the farmers, um, it's moving along well. It's not commercial yet, but it's coming. And uh, so I think we're, we're gonna just keep finding ways, uh, we meaning all of us collectively, to find creative ways to bring the strengths we each have to the party to really make a difference. Yes. I'd like to give uh, three examples, I think, which uh, tie up some of these comments that we've been making. Um, one of them is a regional solution where you, you strengthen farmer organizations, but then you link them up to research. And this is the FANAPAR network, uh, which works in Eastern and Southern Africa. And in this network, you have one organization, it's a think tank, it's particularly skilled in strengthening farmer organizations. So you work with 600 farmer organizations. You link them up to think tanks that do the research, and they then are able to work through what, as Jim mentioned, extension work to get to four million farmers. So the scaling up happens. You are able to strengthen the organization, give them the right uh, access to ideas, and Im impact productivity and, and production levels. And I think this is a, one example of the scaling up through strengthening farmer organizations. The other one is from Burkina Faso, and here it's not in a food area, but it's in the cotton value chain. And you see what Burkina Faso has been able to do, bringing a large number of small farmers, smallholder farmers in cotton, giving them the right science to improve the, the seeds that they use and get the right yields, but then linking it up to uh, manufacturers who want to use uh, certain types of cotton to come up, for instance, with cotton pajamas that are sold then on the world scene. And this is another example from the research to the planting to the harvesting, manufacturing, and export. And there are many other examples like that. The third one uh, is on, uh, on um, share nuts, which have become now the bulk product for skin lotion, shampoos, all creams that are being used around the world. And here it's working with women's organizations who are able to take not just the, the nuts themselves, but to process them first and second stage, get the first basic cream that is input into these high-end products that are sold at Saks Fifth Avenue and so on. So I think one can imagine, uh, and, and we have real examples of, of how pharma organizations can be strengthened because they're linked up to a market, they're linked up to a source of knowledge, and there's an organization that does this teaching together working with the private sector. And I think this is really critical in the food area as well. Just, um, I think, I mean, hearing this, we are seeing a, an emerging model. Clearly, 
it is no longer the case that government would come and do projects or MDBs will come and do projects and have them localized. Some of our most successful experiences are one where we really bring in philanthropists, and I think you mentioned Warren Buffett Gates Foundation, and you have a number of those that are really out there and helping finance actually the effort of development. And I think if you couple that with private sector-led research and solution design into the seed area or along the value chain, then the missing link in my view is the, like Franny mentioned, the, the rural institutions. And I think until we put a lot of emphasis on the importance of rural institutions and farmers' organizations, we will still have a void as to how to transact with them because of the fragmentation and the small number. And last point is also to, to shift focus from, which is a traditional, I think, Bretton Woods uh, inheritance of export-led type of growth or development. Local markets do matter now because of the increased uh, purchasing capacity. Regional markets also do matter. So it is no longer the case that in Burkina you have to export your beans to France. There is a local market, there is a regional market. And I think the private sector has demonstrated that if you focus on your local urban markets and your regional markets, you definitely can, can enhance the income and the livelihood of small producers. Right. I think we've gotten some really, really great ideas on the table just to stir up the conversation. So uh, let me ask the panelists if they have any additional comments for each other or um, anything else to say before we open it up. Because I, I have a sense that there's a, a lot of great ideas sitting in the room as well. Anything else? Okay. So why don't we, uh, why don't we open it up? Um, what I'd like to do is um, take maybe three or four questions or comments at a time. Again, I would like to have everyone be really brief in their comments, and it's really important that you let us know your name and uh, organizational affiliation just so we know who you are. I should mention that um, beyond just the people sitting in this room, we also have a live stream on the internet, so there's hundreds of people out there who are looking at this, so we're going to be taking some questions and comments from them as well, too. So I think we have some microphones. Uh, Simone is helping us with microphones over there, so um, uh, I welcome you all to share some questions and comments. We'll start over there, Simon. There's one there, and um, if you have a, a question for a particular panelist, let us know who it is. Uh, if it's a comment, just let us know from there and then there. We'll take uh, three or four at once. Uh, 